you have to be really intentional about, about putting a team together. Crawl out of the pile and start screaming. How good is Joey Bosa? Rolling, looking, throwing, end zone, touchdown, intercepted. Derwin James. Derwin was there. You got to be on a mission every day in the NFL. But even more than that, you got to be on a mission together. Great hands, Keenan Allen. The Los Angeles Chargers select Rashawn Slater. Asante Samuel Jr. That was that. Oh, I'm strapping y'all boys. I can't catch. Intercepted. Picked off by Michael Davis. Explosion. Explosiveness from Eckler. There's Murphy. Boy, he blew that up, didn't he? It is picked off. Nasir Adderley. 50-50 ball is 100%. Mike Williams. Ojeda, you won't sue. And that will end it. Time to bolt off. Welcome to another episode of Chargers Unleashed. Dan Walkenstein in your speakers and on your screens from the LA Football Network. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at LAC underscore Unleashed. If you are looking for year-round Chargers content, some special guest episodes, and maybe just some fun and authentic perspective, be sure to subscribe to Chargers Unleashed on YouTube and wherever you find your podcast. This episode is brought to you by Brewery X, UFC Fit and Temecula, Charger Bolt Family, and Manscaped. Be sure to use the code LAFB20 and save 20% to get free shipping and 20% off at manscaped.com. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome and thank you for checking us out. We have an amazing show lined up for you today as we have a special guest and Chargers GOAT sitting down with us today. Chargers third round pick in the 2004 NFL Draft. One of the greatest Chargers offensive linemen to ever wear the lightning bolt. A man who rocks a camouflage bib better than anyone I know. Previously mauling defensive linemen on Sundays in the Pro Bowl, representing your Chargers. You can now find him inspiring and helping folks around the country transform their body and lives through health and fitness. Wearing number 61 for your Chargers, Mr. Nick Hardwick, has been kind enough to sit down with us on Chargers at least to talk about Chargers football. Head of this preseason's matchup with the 49ers. Nick, welcome to the show. How's your summer been? How's the family? Dan, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that wonderful overstated introduction. And the summer has been fantastic. Although here in Indiana, the kids are back at school. So summer's over, but it's cool because that means football season has started. My nine and seven-year-old boys are playing fourth and second grade tackle football. And I am doing the coaching, the head coaching. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Which one's going to be the lineman? <laughs> We'll see. But yeah, as a kid, neat, none of them have interest in being a lineman. It's a real hard sales pitch to get a kid to want to play offensive line. But here's kind of what I tell all the kids. I go, hey, you can basically rank the order of importance on a football team based on how much they get paid. And I said, in the, in the offensive linemen, they're right up there with the best players in the league. You just don't know how much they're getting paid. But that left tackle, that left guard, that center, those guys are getting paid a lot of money these days. So don't be opposed to playing offensive line. <laughs> nope, and it certainly helped you out quite a bit in your life outside of football. So we're going to talk about all kinds of fun stuff today. Obviously, we've got to talk offensive line, given who we have here with us as a guest. We're going to talk about this past offseason – some Philip Rivers discussion in comparison to Justin Herbert. Of course, we'll talk about Rashawn Slater, Corey Lindsley. But let's just kind of set the stage here and just kind of talk about just the overall hype and excitement coming from Chargers camp and those kind of following and reporting the team. There is tons of buzz around this team. You got return of Derwin James, Drew Tranquil, you got Justin Herbert, Kenneth Murray, you got Asante Samuel, got a new coach. Got a new stadium, the whole new offensive line. I mean, I could just go on and on and on and on. From your view, Nick, what are some of the things that you're most excited for for this season? I'm excited to see this remade offensive line and how quickly they can come together. Of course, looking at Staley and what he's done in the past with the Rams, I think the Chargers defensive roster this year is stronger than that number one ranked Rams defense that he had last year. So, Person for person, of course, you got Aaron Donald, super disruptive, Michael Brockers, yes, Jalen Ramsey, yes, but through and through, man to man, I do believe this Chargers defensive roster 
is better than the Rams defensive roster last year. So he's got a lot to work with. Bringing that system over, getting those guys up to speed is going to be a great challenge. Teaching them exactly how he wants his defense played, giving the philosophy and all the concepts and laying it out for him. But look at the guys that the Chargers have. Look at the impact players. I'm mostly excited, a little nervous, and super hopeful that Derwin can stay healthy this year because the difference between him on the field and him not on the field, it's night and day. I, we're talking three, four wins. If you did a win above replacement like they do in baseball, the war stat, Derwin James is right up there with the top in the league. So to have him healthy and available and playing the way that he can, I can't wait to see him and, and the impact that he can have. We all are looking forward to Derwin James playing football. And to be honest, me personally, I'm very grateful that he is not playing during the preseason. Uh, he doesn't need to prove anything. Just get this guy on the field. Come Just stay healthy. Season. Just be healthy. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So let, let's talk quarterback for a second. Uh, you played with a future Hall of Famer, in my opinion, Philip Rivers. So you yep. know firsthand what a great quarterback play is like. Now, Justin Herbert enters his second year at the helm following a rookie of the year campaign for offense. And everyone's kind of buzzing for him for this year as well. Just kind of comparing and contrasting the two. Like, what similarities or differences do you see in the way Phil and Justin quarterback and offense on the field? Well, Dan, I think let's not forget I also got a snap for two years to Drew Brees, who's a first ballot Hall of Famer and a top five quarterback in the NFL. So I got a snap to him for two years and Phillip Rivers for nine seasons. And sprinkled in the mix, I got a snap to Doug Flutie, a legend of the game, for two <laughs> games, which was like one of the highlights of my career. Field goal Simil kicker Doug Flutie. I <laughs> uh, just, yeah, exactly. He he was the last person to have a drop kick in an NFL game. And it, go, if you don't know what a drop kick is, go look it up. It's a very rarely used deal, but he had a drop kick in New England that Bill Belichick let him do when he went there after. Uh, he was done on the Chargers, so super cool. Doug Flutie's an unbelievable guy. But when it, when it comes to looking at Justin Herbert and Phillip Rivers, it's really difficult to compare them. You know, there's body style. Yes, he's a big strapping man, but he also has speed and athleticism, and that was never really a currency that Phillip traded in. Phillip traded in brain power. Phillip, Phillip traded in understanding – Every single detail about the offense, where the receivers were supposed to be, what we could move with, with the personnel groupings that we had. We could adjust to any defense. He was the best, I think, in NFL history at picking up and identifying blitzes and getting us into the best play for us to move us forward. He knew every single block and every call that an offensive lineman had. So if we had a new guy in, he could make the calls for you if he needed to. He, he was just so intellectually sound, and he pushed himself so hard when it came to studying that his limited athleticism never was an issue for him. And he had I would what they what I would call is an athletic arm. So he could throw the ball from any slot. He could push it. He could throw it sidearm. He, you know, he could do his standard shot put thing. He was incredibly accurate. And I guess maybe the uh the comparisons can stop there. But from what I understand about Justin, and I haven't been around him and I haven't obviously haven't worked with him, haven't been in meetings with him. So it's almost unfair to say, but what I do read about him is that he's a perfectionist, that he's super into the details, that he's got kind of that engineering type brain, which really reminds me not of Philip Rivers at all, it reminds me of Drew Brees. So Drew Brees was an industrial management major at Purdue, which is a hybrid between an industrial engineer and a manager. And so you get the business aspect, but you also get the engineering component. And in Drew's mind, everything fit into its own place. Everything had a time, a sequence, and was to be where it was at the right time, which is what you see when he went to New Orleans and developed the offense with Sean Payton was a lot of timing routes. Everything was hitting on all cylinders. It was really hard to get them off the tracks if you know you want to use the train tracks as the analogy there. And, and that's kind of very systematic approach where Philip was more 
and this was kind of the brain that got groomed under North Turner was more free thinking, less printing press, less here's what you're going to get week in and week out and more Van Gogh, where some weeks with Norv, it was going to be a starry night and a beautiful composition. And some weeks it was going to be a hot mess because we were going to go in and we were going to feel it out. And we had 150 to 200 pass route combinations available. We had every run imaginable in the book. It was impossible to practice all those things. But we had very smart guys who could handle that load of information without practicing it. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But with Drew, Drew was more of the printing press type where you go in, here's the plan, here's how we're going to attack, here's how we expect them to adjust, and we've got a plan B for that. Boom, boom, boom. And it's going to be very systematic. I have to imagine that with the coaching staff that Staley's assembled in Los Angeles with Joe Lombardi, who was in New Orleans for 10 years between two stints, working with Sean Payton, working with Drew Brees, Shane Day, who was just up in San Francisco, working with Kyle Shanahan in that offense, which is really interesting to me. I think this is a, a fascinating kind of melding of two different styles of offense. So I think you've got a really cool ability because – Let's face it, Justin Herbert's a far superior athlete than Drew Brees, so you have more capabilities. But how do we incorporate both of these offenses into something that's congruent and fits and keeps moving forward rather than going, hey, sometimes we're going to run the Kyle Shanahan offense, and we're going to zone run, we're going to boot out, and we're going to get guys into space. And sometimes we're going to run the Drew Brees offense where it's going to be spread, timing routes, and we're going to throw the ball all over the place. How can we meld the two into a real congruent offense? So to me, that's something super fascinating. But I do think that Herbert's got those type of abilities. He's got that engineering systematic type brain, but he also has the ability on the run to make huge dazzling plays, to get out in space, to let some of the speedy receivers that they've got now to be able to, to stretch it out and, and to create – as you've seen in San Francisco, guys wide open all over the place, and you have to throw the ball to a spot, not necessarily to a man, and the man just runs underneath, and you got big gaping yardage. So that's something for me to look at. But I think Justin's unique. I, I don't, I don't think it's it's fair to Philip, and I don't think it's fair to Justin. I don't think it's fair to Drew to put any of them really into the same boat because they're all pretty unique in their skill sets and their body types and the abilities physically that they have. But the and one I, thing he does have, he's got a huge arm and he's got an accurate arm and he's athletic and he's smart. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like a unicorn. <laughs> uh, we'll take that unicorn on our team any day. Yes. Um, so speaking of a unicorn, let's talk about this success that we had this off season uh, and Tom Telesco. What mm -hmm. he has done this offseason from both like a coaching standpoint and getting kind of that staff bought in place, as well as the players he brought in both in free agency during the draft. Like I've never seen so much churn and change in one offseason. And this, I know every offseason is exciting and every team thinks they're going to the Super Bowl. And of course. you've been through a ton with this team, both as a player and then covering the team. Like what was your kind of just overall favorite move of the offseason? And, and like, where do you see, like, how does this compare to years past? Like, is this different? Like, is this normal? I think what the thing that I'm most excited about and obvious right here is I'm excited about the offensive line and the turnover of the offensive line and, and bringing guys in who still have a lot to prove. So you've got veterans, you've got Balaga, you've got Lindsley who have Lindsley's on 99 starts. Balaga's over that but they still have meat on the bones. And I think different from years past is it seems like you've brought in guys, we brought in guys, Tom's brought in guys that still their operating mode, their base autopilot is to fight and to go hard. And money's not going to change that. A lot of times it's really difficult with free agents, especially older free agents who have been on, a team for a long time and then they're looking for that second or that third contract and you're the team that gets them. A lot of times what you're hoping is that they still give a crap 
that they're still going to, that their operating mode is to just work hard, to practice, to prepare, to fight like a dog when they're on the field. Because as sad as it is, money does change people. You, you play in the NFL. Yes, it's fun. You, you're going to do, it's what we would say is you're doing a man's job. You're a grown man making a King's ransom, playing a kid's game, right? But what happens after you make that King's ransom is a lot of times it becomes work. And now you got to work for that contract. And, and what we've seen in years past is guys who they've rewarded with big contracts either haven't worked as hard as they would hope, them, hope that they would. They weren't as dogged as they would hope they would be as an offensive line because you need some nasty dudes up there to set the tone for the team or unfortunately some of the guys just did not stay healthy and that's kind of that risk that you take with the older veteran but bringing in filer from the Steelers who's got 40 starts Abushi, who's got 42 starts with Detroit those guys they still have a lot to prove and they haven't made it, you know, and in terms of an NFL career, 40 starts is not making it, you know, the money that they've made is not going to, yes, it's life changing, but it's not going to allow them to do whatever the hell they want when they retire. So they have to come in, they have to prove it every single day. And then picking up Slater in the draft to me was awesome. And then getting to watch the game against the Rams and the way that he performed, it just verified everything that everyone had been hyping him up about. He was all that, and he's going to continue to grow and continue to get better. But I loved, I loved what I saw from him week one against the Rams. Have you seen? I mean, you, you mentioned all the guys, but we got now Slater, we've got Filer, we've got Abushi, we've got Lindsley, and of course Balaga, who was out most of the year battling injuries yeah. last year. Like, have you ever seen? a complete overhaul in an offensive line that quickly and that successfully. I know it's early, but. Okay. So I'd, I'll give you an example of my rookie year and this in 2003, the chargers were four and 12. My rookie year, we ended up being 12 and four. And what we did was we went and got a sixth year veteran at the time, Mike Goff, who ended up being our right guard. And we got him from Cincinnati and gave him a good, healthy contract but he was a worker and he was going to be there every single day. He was going to be on time and he fought like crazy. And he was a hell of a player for us for a long time. We also went and traded for Roman Oban, who was a Super Bowl champion with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And we got him to kind of anchor us as the veteran presence. And he was instrumental, kind of like Balaga could be or like Lindsley could be, where they let us know how to be professionals. Both Mike and Roman did that. And they showed us how to show up to work. Roman, in fact, made us as rookies, as an uh, entire offensive line before a game. We'd have to do a two-page summary on every player that we we're getting ready to face. So usually you have one or two nose guards, one or two defensive tackles that you're going to face if you're a guard. And then you'd have to do a write-up on the outside linebacker, the defensive end, if you were a tackle. And then we'd have to, it'd have to be really nice, typed up with a picture of the guy. Here's my individual game plan against this guy, right? Vince Wilfork or Richard Seymour, or Ty Law or who, or Ty Warren, you know, whoever it was going to be. And we had to present that to the rest of the offensive line. Interesting. And that was just a step of development towards professionalism. And you don't know how to be a professional coming from college. You don't know how much film is necessary to watch. You don't even know what you're supposed to be watching for when you're watching film <laughs> most of the time, unless you come from an incredible program with a great coach. But in college, you don't really have that much time with your coaching staff to watch film. So having somebody sit down with you, show you how to watch film, show you what you're looking for tell you how to game plan, give you all the tools necessary. That's what the older veterans can do. And then they drafted me with a third pick. And then we had Shane Olivier, who was ended up, he was a seventh yes. rounder, but he ended, he ended up being a right tackle. And then for the first little bit, it was Tony Finotti, who was kind of a holdover. And he was a, a monster of a man at left guard. And then Chris Dealman quickly inserted himself into that position. But that was it can happen in a hurry and that culture can be built in a hurry. And it's all a matter of who those veterans are. And then you've got the wild card. You got Slater, the young kid who comes in. And I, I remember being, I was the wild card because there was a veteran, Jason ball, 
who was holding out at center, and they drafted me, and they didn't know when he was going to come back. But if he did come back, they were expecting him to start. And I just came in, owned the position, and I was kind of loud, a little flamboyant. I had long hair. I was rowdy. I wanted to fight everybody all the time. And, you know, you get that that comes in as a, as a rookie who's playing a little scared. You play like your hair's on fire. And I kind of saw a little bit of that in Slater the other night, which was exactly what you want out of your, your mash of an offensive line. And, and I think they did a wonderful job. They completely committed. I think they've learned from previous mistakes of which type of guys to bring in and which type to avoid. And I think they've done a great job. And I guess we'll see the, uh, the proof will be in the pudding. We, we don't need to call any names, but in terms of guys or archetypes to avoid for offensive line, like what are some of like, the mistakes that you've seen the Chargers do in the past that maybe they've learned specifically? You know, I think, I think what a, a good lesson is, why is a team letting a guy go? Why are they not holding on to somebody that you're so attracted to? You know, it's like just because a guy's available doesn't mean he's the best fit for your team. So, of course, I'm not going to put any, not going to throw anybody under the bus or anything like that. But I think you can look at perhaps the back end of seasons when teams aren't winning and you can watch a guy's performance, not in the first four games, not maybe in the first eight games or 12 games if the team's hanging on, but you can really look for it when a team's not having the success that they expected to have or or that's going to get him into the postseason and say, how's he perform when it doesn't matter, right? How's he going to perform when we're not going to make the playoffs, we're not getting the bonus check, all that work they've previously done through the offseason and training camp, when that's kind of all, I guess, as a player, you could look at it as a waste or you could say, shoot, I still get to play ball. I still, I still get to go out here and put on this jersey with my name on the back and play with my buddies and protect my quarterback and protect my running back. That, to me, is, is the critical times. And then I think a lot of times, just pick up the phone. Pick up the phone and call, call, that, offensive, call that offensive line coach or call somebody who played with him and say, how was he? Because I think everybody, you know, offensive line coaches, offensive line men, it, they're a pretty honest bunch overall. I think they'll <laughs> they'll tell you if they liked fighting next to a guy or if they didn't trust him. Yep, and it's and it's interesting too because that goes back to your like the why. Like if folks are trying to play just so they can get a paycheck, like you'll notice that when it comes to yep. week sixteen and they're already out of the playoffs. But yeah. if they're playing because they love the game, they love the people around them, you can see that dog that fight like kind of stay, which. That's the guy you want. And I think that's the kind of group that this team, it looks like we've actually tried to focus on. Like Matt Filer, I mean, that guy is a beast. Ode Abuja yeah. is a beast. Yeah. And Rashawn Slater, because of Northwestern, like he he plays because he loves it. He's just an average, normal human being. But you see him flip the switch and it's like, whoa. <laughs> like the guy's kind of scary in a good yes. way. And then he comes off the field and like he's the happiest go lucky guy ever. Yeah. You don't want guys who are just going out to do their job. You want guys who are pretty damn exuberant about their job, who I was scared every time I took the field. I mean, I, I stood on the sidelines and I look across the way and I go, oh my God, who's in charge of that guy? And then I'd look around and I go, oh, I guess it's me. Well. <laughs> but my fear always translated into charging ahead and going harder, right? My fear never froze me. My fear never made me run away. My fear always said, let's do this and make it let's let's go a little harder and that's the kind of guys that it seems like telesco's brought in and i really did i i've said this publicly before and and it really i think it's true if tom didn't get this offensive line right i think this would be nearing the end for tom because you've obviously got the quarterback of the future now you have to keep him safe and the offensive line's in charge of setting the tempo for the whole team. I, I don't care what football team it is. If you've got a great football team, the offensive line is the core of that team. Well, let's, let's talk about it then. So the importance of a competent or a good offensive line 
Like, I think we now have seen it on both sides, how bad the team can be when it's not good and how good a team can be when it is good. Like, what makes... Because I, th- I think people sometimes mistake the idea of like, oh, we have a great left tackle, like our offensive line is good. But like, I think a lot of people miss like the cohesion that needs to be there. Like, yeah. what are some of the kind of tactical traits or signs that like fans or folks covering the team can look for when they're watching this offensive line group coming together, not just individually, but like as a cohesive unit? Yeah, if I think if you're you're watching for something – a lot of what you're watching for is how cleans the pocket is communication on par and how that would translate because like any good relationship, if communication has to be number one, it has to be high end communication. And that really starts with Corey in the middle coming up, establishing what defense it is, who's in charge of what, where's the Mike linebacker. He's going to tell everybody where to go. And I know he had a lot of responsibilities in green Bay. Cause I know another center who played in green Bay before him, who said, my goodness, there was a lot of responsibilities up there. So I know he's going to, he had a lot on his plate up there with Aaron, and I'm sure he's going to have a lot on his plate here, but it's something that he can most certainly handle. So you come in, you establish the front, you pass the communication down, and how that shows up really is everybody's on the same page, and we're not having free runners in the backfield. Guys aren't splitting the gap. The back will even be on the same page with the offensive line. The tight ends are going to be right there with them. So communication is probably the most important thing is we would always say it's it's okay to get the call wrong but let's all do the call wrong together let's not have some of the line doing the call one way and some of the line doing the call the other way if we're all wrong together at least we're all on the same page and the quarterback knows how to adjust off of that you're all going down on the ship together (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that's totally okay because if the quarterback knows who's he's, who he's responsible for, he can throw a hot route or a side adjust. He can adjust based on where the offensive line is protecting him and where they're not. And so that's number one. And then a lot of things really are kind of the intangibles. And I think this they have the luxury this year of not being so isolated in meetings, being able to perhaps go out to dinner with one another, being able to travel a little in closer proximity, because I really believe that the team who wins at the end of the season is the team who can come together the closest at the beginning of the season, stay together throughout the season, but really love one another the most. Because when you love and you care for your teammates, the most, you're willing to do more for them. You're willing to wake up earlier. You're willing to get in and do all that nitty gritty work, lift weights, take care of your body, do the maintenance protocols. I mean, it sounds selfish, right? I'm lifting weights. I'm getting a massage. I'm going to the chiropractor. I'm sitting in the steam room and the ice tub and the, in the hot tub and doing all these. That's, but really you, you taking care of yourself is giving your teammate a better body, showing up at meetings on time, being attentive. If I care for my teammates, one, I'm willing to call them out, but two, I'm willing to show up and be present because I know that their success depends on me and my success depends on them. And I can't tell you how many fights we got into with one another because, you know, if your buddy's in a compromised position, that's your job is to be there and to protect him. And you are just, when you love and care for a teammate and your, your collective group loves and cares for each other, and then you love and care for the quarterback and the skill position guys, you will do so much more for one another than you would ever do by yourself or for yourself, honestly. We're talking to Nick Harbick, and it's just so refreshing, Nick. So thank you so much for even going through the depths of this, because I think a lot of people underestimate the importance and like the resiliency of an offensive line and kind of the work that goes into it. And hearing you kind of talk about these specifics, I think may open folks' eyes to how hard it is to beat offensive linemen. Like people get on offensive linemen all the time. Like, I can't believe they're being a turnstile. They let that guy go by so quickly. And <laughs> they shot the A gap as if like they could go out and be six, five in a hurry and go do it. And so it, it's not easy. And so being able to kind of hear like your firsthand experience about just like, the specifics of what makes oh, it so hard. It's the it's one of the most unnatural positions in sports. First off, it's unnatural for a body to be able to carry that amount of mass to to have the bone structure that can hold that kind of weight, that kind of muscle mass. <laughs> and it's it's really 
the only positions in football that are combative every single day are offensive line and defensive line. The other guys, they can hit and move around. They're in their shells and they take care of each other. Yes, they're running. Yes, they're working, but we're fighting every day. We're wrestling every single day. We're having head contact every single day. And it doesn't matter if you're in shells, if you're in shorts and helmets, or if you're in full pads, you're getting after it because the coaching, st- things don't look normal for an offense. Things don't look normal for a defense, spacing and timing. All that is off if an offensive line is going light or if a defensive line is going light. Yeah, we taper it back just a touch, but there's full contact. It is a very glamorous manual labor position. I mean, it is digging ditches with a shovel on a daily basis and standing there upright as a 320 pounder or somebody who looks like Aaron Donald is running at you and taking one in the chin and trying to forklift him off of his center of gravity. It's very unnatural to do that. Most people, when somebody's running at them, they hunker down like a turtle and get into a little cave and try to protect themselves. Everything about being an offensive lineman is completely against your instincts and a lot of times against kind of your athletic training. So it's uh, it's a really unique position, but it's a pretty awesome one. And and what a lot of people don't understand is it's incredibly technical. It's incredibly technical. We used to have DBs come over to work hands with us because punching and pass protection is essentially like backpedaling and boxing at the same time where you have to time your feet and hands up. They have to be in perfect sync to be able to have any type of impact. If your right hand doesn't hit with your right foot, if your right hand, when you punch, you're on your left foot, it's going to be really weak and your arm's going to cave in. Everything has to be so timed up. We would count our steps. We count our punches. I mean, it was, it's wildly, wildly technical. I realize it's completely underappreciated except by a few. And I, I know we just look like big fat men <laughs> belly bumping out there. It's so much harder, and there's so much more detail than that. When you hear folks call them big ugly, it's like, do you take that personal, or do you like, well, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, uh, yeah, there are, there are some ugly guys, but there's also some pretty good looking guys. But overall, everyone's fairly big. It just it was funny in the in the huddle for me because I was always they would call me Nicky Poo because my uh, That's cute. our offensive our offensive line coach. My second year, Carl Mock, he just he called me short britches or Nicky Poo. So everyone just started calling me Nicky Poo or Pooh Bear or something like that. So, you know, there's uh, big uglies or Pooh Bear or what, you know, whatever they want to call you. <laughs> All right. So I feel there's nobody better to ask this question who can represent kind of the Chargers and represent good center play than a Mr. Nick Hardwick. You understand the importance of a quality center and what it takes to excel. Uh, You certainly check both of those boxes during your playing days. Arguably, I think the most important off-season acquisition for this Chargers team, and I think every, I shouldn't say every, but the majority of Chargers fans were crossing fingers and begging to get Corey Lindsley. And then, sure enough, they get him. Given your experience at the position, like what are some tangible differences that we may be able to see from a Corey Lindsley to like an average or below average center. Like what what tangible differences are we going to see that is going to stand out that maybe folks are underestimating or don't know about? So a bunch of them, but the for me what really stands out about a center is that is the tip of the spear. And the inside three, the center and the two guards are really responsible for denting the defense when it comes to the run game. So I would look for run game production to really shoot up with Corey and the new guards that they brought in because that's what they're there to do. Yeah, to create a firm pocket when it comes to pass protection, but on the running side of things, really denting that defense and creating forward movement, not just horizontal sideline to sideline, but creating holes vertically, as we would say. And that could be a big one from Corey. We already talked about communication coming up, letting everybody know what they're going to do, taking as much off of your lineman's plate as possible, you know, letting them know early in the snap 
what the call is going to be. Identifying the defense very quickly is important. Getting the calls out so they can pass the communication down the line and allow them to settle into their stance and really kind of have a moment to gather themselves, to think about their technique, and to execute the technique is a big one. And then great centers take a lot off of their quarterback's plate. So as much as he can handle from a communication and a visual standpoint, being able to take Herbert's eyes off of at least the box and being able to alert him to potentially some safety movements that indicates, you know, the blitz is coming from this direction or that direction. And if possible, identifying the blitz, calling the blitz to the right side, getting everybody assembled to put, R5 offensive lineman and a running back and perhaps a tight end onto the best five, six, or maybe even seven guys to be able to do that and allow Justin to focus on his job. That's the sign of a great center for me is being able to, to take as much as you possibly can off of the quarterback's plate to be able to make last minute adjustments, to give him alerts and to allow Justin to focus on his work. And I think that's where you hear about the sophomore slump a lot from all different positions where a player knows a little much, he's trying to do a little too much, thinking a little bit more than maybe he should, where as a rookie, you come in and you just turn it loose because what the hell, I have nothing to lose. I think Corey can help Justin get beyond that by allowing him to not expand his responsibility, but to consolidate really his responsibility to think more about what do I have to do on this play from a technical standpoint? What do my feet need to be like? What's the reads that I have to make and do that and not have to worry about everything that's going on in the box. They've got guys moving around. I got to get the line over here. The safeties are moving there. It's like if Corey can take a lot off of Justin's plate, Justin can worry about himself and his own execution, getting the receivers in the backs where they need to be, and then we're all good. And, and that, that was probably the craziest thing for me watching Justin Herbert last year was seeing like how literally it felt like he was running around with his hair on fire for multiple mm-hmm. quarters, multiple games, where he had to – it seemingly was having to do many positions jobs yeah. while also being a quarterback. And so having – that luxury of being able to kind of just not take a step back, but be able to reevaluate and hone in on what your job is and be yeah. able to trust everyone else. Hopefully again, I know it's early, but I think we should be able to see some drastic improvements in that area. Yeah. I mean, think about how they always talk about the beginner and the master are essentially performing at the same level, right? It's like, let's not overcomplicate this thing because he's in his second year. Let's continue to find ways to make it simple to allow him to do what he's capable of doing. And when the play breaks down, yeah, he does have this added benefit of this incredible physicality and being able to make plays on the run and do all that. But let's not rely on that. That would be, as as I watch Justin, as I watch athletic quarterbacks, the one issue that I have with a lot of those guys is that it seems like the coaching staff really rewards them when they just make a play. And I I guess my questioning would be, because I'm not in those meeting rooms, and I've never really been in the meeting rooms with athletic quarterbacks, is do they sit and watch the film and go, hey, that's a hell of a job making that play, picking up 20 yards with your legs, congrats, thanks. Or do they say, do you know we could have had 12 yards if you would have hit the tight end right here? Because we'd rather have the 12 yards, honestly, than the 20 yards with your legs and save you some hits, save you some wear and tear, and just pick up the easy yards. Let's be more efficient with our body. And that's where you get to the level when you've got guys like A-Rod playing as long as he has, Drew Brees playing as long as he has. That's why Phillip Rivers was able to play 17 seasons, right, on a unlimited athletic ability. That's why Tom Brady, who ran a 5'4", 5'5", 40 is 45 years old and still doing it because he was making the reads. And and like I said early, they weren't trading in that athletic currency. So mm-hmm. I would just caution at this point is you have the ability when necessary, but let's not bypass the reads and bypass the throws that you can most certainly make in that development early in your career for the sake of some cheap yards, because that's a short-term fix for a long-term problem. Let's sure. let's worry about the long-term and grow into 
what you can be instead of thinking about how good you are now. As awesome as it is to be on sports in our top 10 plays, uh, a lot of people that are on those top 10 plays aren't on, having large careers for very extended <laughs> yeah. times. And you don't need to make yes. all those crazy plays. Uh, and you see a lot of that with like a Russell Wilson, where the first three quarters of a game, he's very much kind of like a game manager. He doesn't really have, I mean, he's a fantastic quarterback, but he's unbelievable. Yeah. Fourth quarter is when you see him work his magic and he will manage mm-hmm. the rest of the game. But when it comes down to winning time, then he'll put on the line. And I think that. In yeah. theory, that's what you'd like to see Justin Herbert be able to kind of mold into. I 100% agree, and I'm a huge Russell Wilson fan, but that's exactly it. It's know the timing of know where you're at in the game. Like you said, if it's on the line, if it's critical, let's go make that play because I have to. We don't have a choice. If not, let's live to fight another play, and let's manage this game, and let's keep pushing this thing forward. Yep, yeah. Okay, so we're talking to center for the Chargers, Nick Hardwick. And folks who are watching, there's no way they would think that you played center given how ripped you (laughs) are now. (laughs) Uh, You lost a ton of weight shortly after you retired. Kind of talk to us about, you mentioned a little bit at the top, but talk to us a little bit about just kind of like the day in the life of an offensive lineman. Like, what's that workout routine like? I know it's not normal, but like, what are the meals like? What's the mentality? Like, take us into the life of an offensive lineman during that career, and then we'll get into kind of what your life has been like post-career. Yeah. So you you got kind of two guys. You got some guys who aren't naturally big men like me who had to eat six, 7,000 calories a day. I had to work out six days a week, even during the season, just to maintain my muscle mass as we're going through the season. The, the eating contest lifestyle, I was, I'd wake up at 4.15, get in the facility by 4.45, but on the way there, I was eating two protein bars and I'd go for a workout. I'd have two... 350 calorie shakes afterwards. I'd sit in the hot tub, cold tub. After that, I'd go to breakfast, have a huge breakfast with a smoothie. I had a bag of nuts, bag of almonds sitting on my desk that I could just bolster my calories throughout the day. I would, I mean, it was, I'd have three separate meals at night when I got home and that didn't include lunch or the extra protein drinks that I was having after practice. I would have a meal with my wife and then I'd have a Greek yogurt and like I don't know, eight tablespoons of peanut butter mixed in with four servings of Greek yogurt. And then at night, at the end of my career, I would eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's every single night sitting in bed. So it was disgusting and awesome all at the same time. And some guys, some guys honestly have a difficult time keeping their weight down. They're just naturally bigger men with naturally bigger appetites and huge bone structure. And I played with guys like that who struggled. Now for me, getting the weight off was imperative. Just the number one concern for all football players obviously should be the brain. You you have to take care of the brain. The only way to take care of the brain that's scientifically proven is through physical exercise. And you can't exercise if you're big because your joints get deteriorated too fast. So you got to lose the weight, take the stress off the joints, so then you can continue to exercise, so you can continue to pump fresh blood and oxygen back to the brain. And so for me, that was kind of the the cause for getting the weight off. And then now my life's kind of turned into, I guess, campaigning for other offensive linemen to get small and for regular civilians and gen pop people, gen pop general population, get those folks to reclaim their health. And, and as I found, I mean, when you're healthy, when you're fit, when you're active, oh my God, is life good. It's such a blessing. And there's so many experiences that you can have, but you can't have them and you can't fully enjoy them if you're not healthy. And even if you can, can you enjoy them for the long haul? I want to enjoy them when I'm 85, 90, maybe a hundred years old. I mentioned earlier, I mean, you went through such a transformation and folks looked at you and saw you physically when you were a center versus now. I mean, it's hardly able to be recognized sometimes. Uh, You created your own organization, Hardwick Life, and it seems like it's kind of laser focused on helping others lose weight, build muscle and kind of gain back the energy and confidence and kind of just having a health transformation program, whether it's through exercise or through supplements, either fundamental or performance. Just talk to us about your company for a sec. I know I was looking at it around. I'm like, man, I got to get some of this stuff. How did you start <laughs> this company? And and what are you bringing? I mean, I'm seeing these like success stories on Instagram constantly. Yeah. Like, how did, how did you 
bring this from like idea to you're now the CEO of a company. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to funny to say that I'm a hack. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny to hear you say that. Um, so for like, this will be my seventh season out of the National Football League, and, and I'm not exaggerating. For five seasons, I had people that continued to write me on Instant Messenger or on on the DMs of IG or through email or whatever, just wondering, how did you lose the weight? How did you lose the weight? I frankly got tired of like sending them text messages or emails or DMs or whatever it was, like one off, hey, do this, here's how I did it. And so when COVID hit last year, we actually relocated back to Indiana and I had tons of time on my hand. And so I just sat here and I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to put it on a Google doc and see what happens. And that way, if somebody asks, I can just send them the link and that's it. I don't have to like continue to one off message these folks because I do want to help. And I'm like too nice not to reply to somebody. So if somebody hits me up in the DMs, I promise you, I will reply to you. And so I did that. And the first guy that wrote me, he's like, Hey, how'd you lose all the weight? I was like, Hey dude, do you want to try something? And he was like, yeah. And I, I sent him the Google doc and it was just so raw. It was like a hundred and something pages. And I sent it to him and I said, just do me a favor. Send me an email every couple of weeks. Let me know how you're doing. Keep track of your weight loss. And, you know, I just want to check in on you. You seem like a really good dude. He's a 53 year old. Uh, John Zinser is his name. He played football at the University of Pennsylvania. He was six foot three, 325 when he started. And the first month he lost 30 pounds. And I thought, holy hell, like this really works for other people. It worked. <laughs> it, it worked. I was so amazed. And after that, I said, okay, I asked for five more volunteers on Instagram. I got five real quickly. And I said, okay, take the program. Now we're going to meet on the weekend. We're going to have a Zoom call. We're all going to meet up. John's going to help us out, keep you guys in line. And we just got together a little camaraderie, a little accountability. All those dudes were losing like 20, 30 pounds a month. I was like, holy Jesus. And then, so I said, okay, now it's worked for everybody who's been in the program that's had kind of this accountability system built in. So I said, okay, why don't I turn it into an ebook? So I found a, somebody who does all that because I, I am completely incapable. I said, do something with this. And they did. And we launched it. And it went like gangbusters. And then I got on a big bog, a big podcast, actually a San Diego guy, Carlsbad guy, Brian Buffini. He's got a massive following. He's a real estate coach. And I got on his podcast and it just so happened I got on his podcast the week after Matthew McConaughey was on his show. <laughs> so <laughs> so I think for last, right? <laughs> I, I got the good fallout from that. So that really worked out for me. And yeah, it's just been kind of this growing deal. And I've had a podcast probably for three years now. And this is really how Hardwick Life started was it started as finding center because I thought it was kind of cute. I was the center and trying to find myself after football and all that. We've since rebranded it to the Hardwick Life just to kind of make everything congruent. But really, I was after 30,000 head hits, 11 years in the league, three years at Purdue, basically what I was doing was searching for best practices to recover my health and to maintain my health for as long as possible. So it's crazy. You get a podcast, you know, you got to talk to people that it's like on the street, I would never approach, or I would never have access to Stanford neuroscientist, Andrew Huberman or Harvard cardiologist, or, you know, people at Johns Hopkins or Yale or like all these high-end researchers who are the very premier in their field that are going to come on and talk to me and give best practices of how to take care of yourself. And so what I did basically was like extract the juice from every one of those podcasts. And I'm like, what should we be doing? What should we be taking? How do we lose more weight? How can we hold on to more muscle? And I basically put that all into the ebook. And then with the supplementation recommendations that they have, I just went out and built a product line based on what they were saying was best practices and here's what you need and here's why you need it. And so I just kind of, based on what the experts told me, I went out and built this and it's, uh, it's been a hell of a learning curve. It's been super engaging for me. It gives me reason to wake up and get after it every single morning. And selfishly it's, it's super fun, but it also holds me accountable to, 
the healthy lifestyle that I'm promoting, you have to live it. I, I never would believe a leader who doesn't practice what they preach. And I practice what I preach every single day. I will say, uh, I don't know if everybody can say this, but I certainly gained like the COVID-19, the COVID-20 during it. And like, I'm starting to kind of get back into like physical fitness and getting back into yep. like, the gym routine. I tried cryotherapy the first time. And it sounds oh. like, it sounds like you basically took the cliff notes of all of the like best practices from all the smart people and just gave everyone like the most important little tidbits and be like, here, like, you don't need to read 17 novels, just read one, more or less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It I I think the health and fitness and the wellness space, it can be super complex. It can be as complex and as confusing as you let it be. But what we knew as kids and what our parents taught most of us isn't that far off. You know, it's like we don't have to completely reinvent the wheel. What we do have to do is control our consumption of food control our consumption of calories, but the foods you're probably eating now will work. There's a guy who did like 60 something days eating exclusively McDonald's for every single meal and lost a ton of weight doing it. So it's, it's not even necessarily the food you eat, although the food you eat will most certainly help <laughs> the, the, I'm saying the food choices. Now the calories is the key. So when it comes to weight loss or weight gain, for that matter, it's all about the calories. So somebody who says they can't lose weight, well, they're eating too much. Somebody who says they can't gain weight, well, you're not eating enough. I feel I know and, this is a podcast, but I feel like you're talking directly at me. This is great. I'm trying like writing notes <laughs> mentally. <laughs> Good, but that but that is that really is the truth of it. Is and then the foods that we choose can be more satiating. They can keep us fuller for longer. They can allow our signaling to go on in our brain and our body, which tells us, hey, buddy, you've had enough time to back away from the table. You don't need to eat anymore today. Or the choices that we make can also lead to late night binge eating, late night snacking, late night heading to the pantry, all of those things that so many people have issues with. The choices we make early in the day a lot of times catch up to us late in the day. And so really what I'm trying to give to people is simple, affordable, and habitual really is what you're trying to establish is like the daily habits that will allow them to easily have success over the long haul. And now don't get me wrong, like learning the proper techniques, the habits, and the skills, it takes a while to get up to speed with that. But once you kind of master those then health isn't that hard. And then really health isn't necessarily a choice. At some point you turn the corner and you have to actively choose to take a day off or you have to actively choose to allow yourself to have that pizza or that ice cream or that beer. So and that's when, looking on his head. that's when you're in a really sweet spot with health is when health is on autopilot and I have to choose to go do something opposite of that. For folks who have not seen the Hardwick Life, go check out what Nick has built. Uh, it is really spectacular, and like the the number of reviews and things people are saying, and all of like the testimonials that you've gotten. I mean, I just keep scrolling through Instagram. I'm like, man, I'm seeing six pack after six pack. I'm like, this is insane. <laughs> so for for folks who have not checked out what he does, Nick Hardwick uh, practices what he preaches and has gone from offensive lineman to now shredded and looks quite good. Man to man, all good. Um, Thank we're, you, wrapping, Dan. we're wrapping up with Nick Hardwick. Uh, let's end on a we always try to end these conversations on like a fun note. And yeah. and I've heard some fun stories uh, about a one Nick Hardwick when he was playing. You talked about how you kind of ran around flamboyant, you did all kinds of stuff, got yourself in some trouble, got in some fights. Previously, there was a story. I don't know if anybody's heard this or seen this, but there's a story on Instagram post where you were sitting in a trophy case and Let's just say you were less than fully dressed. Um, <laughs> yep. I, I'm dying to know the backstory of how that actually came to fruition. Okay, so nudity was a huge part of my career in the National Football League. I heard. I think and, Sean Merriman talked about it too, didn't he? Yeah, we we I've, I had been caught before doing naked squats <laughs> while everybody else was at meetings. There's. There was plenty of opportunities to get naked. I, I don't know if that would actually fly in the current NFL in the, in the climate now, but hey, I made it out safe, so thank you. Um, I was actually walking by, it was the old 
1995 Chargers AFC Championship Trophy. And they were, it, it was the trophy case. They were cleaning out and redoing the lobby at Chargers Park in San Diego. And I walked past it and I didn't think anything of it, but I was walking into the building with a coach who was a former player who was also just buck wild. And his name is Greg Minuski. He's still in the NFL and he's just absolutely hysterical. And he walks, he looks at it and he's like, Hey, you know what I would do if I were you? And I was like, what coach? And he's like, I take all my clothes off and sit in there and just wait for everybody to come. And I was like, well, how am I going to get the lid back on? Cause it was like three <laughs> feet off the ground is this big pedestal with a giant plexiglass lid on the top. That was probably three feet tall to hold the trophy. And he said, well, I'll help you out. So I, I took all my clothes off, stuffed them in the hallway and came back out onto the loading dock area behind the building and sat up there cross-legged and <laughs> closed my eyes. And he put the lid back over the top of me. And we just kind of waited there for a while for people to start to show up to work. And I just, I kept my eyes closed. And thankfully there's uh, some pictures some some video or some picture evidence that it did take place so when i'm old i i won't think that i was crazy looking back but it's so good i mean there's there's so many things like that that it, like the right song will trigger something a memory that i just had or you know something of a teammate in the locker room i mean there's there was priceless priceless moments that we had together <laughs> what was the best reaction you got from somebody that walked by it was hard to tell because I had my eyes closed. I just, I just realized at one point I had probably better get out of there before the females start coming to work. Otherwise, you know, we're going to get in some real trouble. When it was the coaches and the players, all good. When the front office started to come in, and what I would call corporate America, when they would, when they started to come in, it was like, all right, it's it's time to shut this operation down. Oh my gosh! Well, I, th Nick, thank you so much for telling us the stories and giving us some insight. I know this has been. Uh, there's been a lot here and I'm really actually looking forward to kind of going back and listening to some of the offensive line stuff you said, because cool. I'm literally was trying to write down notes. and I was like, I can't keep up. So I'm just going to go back and do that later. Um, there we go. Nick, thank you so much for joining us on Chargers Unleashed. This has been a pleasure. Uh, you're welcome on the show anytime. Where can all of the great Chargers fans and folks listening to Chargers Unleashed find you when you're not shredded in the gym? <laughs> just, just find me at Nick Hardwick. On 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 Instagram, I'm Nick Hardwick on Twitter. Although that's a vile place, and I rarely use it, so I do my best to stay off of there. At least Instagram's fairly friendly most of the time. So <laughs> there, uh, Facebook, you can find me Nick Hardwick or Hardwick Life, and Hardwick dot Life is our website. But just everything's on uh, at Nick Hardwick. And hey, if you want to meet me too, you can set up a little meeting with me. So I I. I do that. I Zoom people. I do a lot of nutritional consultations and all that. And hey, if you're just a fan and want to hang out with me, I'd love to hang out with you too. So let's let's share some stories. I love that. You might be hearing from me soon because I need some help with my weight loss <laughs> journey. I so. got you. I got you, buddy. Oh, if anybody anybody wants uh, to get a part of the Lose Like Alignment program, use the code HARDWICK20 for 20% 20 off of that thing. Yeah. There you go. And then, and then let me know you bought it and we'll uh, we'll dial you in. I love it. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. This has been so much fun. We'll have you on, hopefully, at another point once we see this team go to the Super Bowl because they look like they are ready and qualified to do so with this offensive line. Thank you for all your Gosh. insight. I and we will so. talk to you soon. All right, Nick? Thanks, Dan. The Los Angeles Chargers select Rashawn Slater. Asante Samuel Jr. Stop. Stop. Oh, I'm stopping y'all boys. That's going to Explosiveness from Eckler. There's Murphy. Boy, he blew that up, didn't he? There. It is picked off. Nasir Adderley. 50 50 ball is 100%. Mike Williams. Ojeda Nuosu. And that will end it. Time to bolt up.